we've got a couple routes that were just opened, so that's always good. Moscow was not a comfortable city for a Frenchman. A local composer had just written a piece uh, people were calling the 1812 Overture, commemorating the Russian victory over Napoleon's invading Grande Army in that fateful year. Patriotic patch passions were at fever pitch. But I did not let that stop me from exploring the city, though I resolved to... affect an English accent in the style of Monsieur Fogg should I encounter anyone. I am not ashamed to admit that I had been practicing that very skill for some time, though it must be said not in the vicinity of my master. I traversed the city on foot, keeping out of sight of the patrols of uniformed policemen and Cossack troops mounted on black mechanical steeds. I ventured away from the wide boulevards and the eclectic architecture of uh, Tversky's street towards the Kremlin. Spaskaya Tower, topped by the two-headed imperial eagle, loomed over the square, but my eye was drawn to a woman handing out pamphlets by a public water fountain. She was carefully avoiding the Cos Cossack patrols and keeping away from the more finely dressed ladies and gentlemen in the square. I took a pamphlet from her, intending to question her of its contents, but she hurried away with some Alacrity. The pamphlet itself was printed on very cheap paper and had a crude picture of a rather morose-looking farmer drawn in the middle of acrylic text. As the bells of the nearby church chimed the hour, I returned to my master, content with my brief view of the Tsar's capital city. Hmm. wonder what that was all about. Alright, so I'm in Moscow. It'd be cheaper to go around, it looks like. I'd be paying a hefty penny or three just to get across. It would take me 14 days to get to Vladivost, but it would cost me over 3,000 pounds. I, th I think that's the path I want to take. You know what, I'm going to stay a day because... and not plan my route yet because... I kind of want to get more info here in Moscow, and I also want to check out the market. Alright, so I spent a little while polishing shoes, so my funds have gone up. Overhearing that some buyers will pay well for hunting rifles from Oms. Most intriguing. Indeed. Oh, this... Yeah, these things are worth a pretty penny here. Alright, pay, pay. Alright, so I have a pamphlet. Routes for around the Caribbean Sea would be open. The railway cap would be useful for sure. And this should be worth a pretty penny because I'm going to actually be heading to Vladivost. Or even Karimskada. Since I have room. Let's see what that opens. Oh, it opens quite a bit. Most of it benefiting, uh, North and South America. Benefit it is. No, I have a good amount of money, so. And this would cost me nineteen hundred pounds. It's fine with me. Alright, so we have our plan. So, before retiring, I engaged another guest in conversation, but gathered little views. God damn it. Alright, let's 
get that trip going. So, ooh, the cold climate set. I am so smart. I figured since the southern part of Asia was like full desert region and all that, and I suffered tremendously for it. Going across the north towards more the North Pole, I figured it would be cold, so I completed the cold climate set. I would have lost 56 hearts, but it looks like it's going to be weathered down to only six. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay. Unless something like this happens. Please, please don't ruin my fantastic evening. <laughs> please. The bell and the uh, Stuclid and whitewashed Moscow station gave it its third and final clang and the platform erupted into frenzy. We boarded calmly and found ourselves in a small cabin with heated water and even a shaving mirror. Damn right. Don't worry. We'll be fine. Oh! An, an Artificer's Guild outpost. Sounds good. Might want to get in touch with them then. So by the time we get there, to our destination, I'll be like, maybe around day 30, approximately, day 25 to day 30. Considering how long it took me to get to here, to Hong Kong, I think that would be like, huge, and then I would be able to afford spending extra time getting myself ready for the next leg of the journey. I have my eyes on the prize, man. Game on. So I familiarized myself with the train's layout. The last two carriages were heavily guarded prison car- oh, Jesus. I just realized something then. This train's going to get taken over. <laughs> we're going to get derailed from this, aren't we? Amenities scattered between passenger cars. The candlelit chapel was presided over by long-bearded or, uh, orthodox priests and full of the pious and was positioned near the crew's quarters. I spent an hour listening to their murmur chanting and felt quite reassured. My bed that night swayed along with the motion of the train. From Moscow to Kornimskaya was a journey of over 5,000 miles and we had only just begun. I just committed myself to a very dangerous exhibition. Yep. I do want to get to Vladivostok, or however you want to pronounce it. Hmm. Is there a way to Yokohama? A regular Korean trader service from uh, to Yokohama, but it's slow going. Well, if I get there in record time, then I can afford taking a slower uh, passageway. And then I can get to Salt Lake City if I buy a katana blade from Yokohama. Interesting. And people in Gastown would pay well for some stuff from Yokohama. And you can buy revolvers in Honolulu, which are valuable in Panama City. Now I remember I got, in my first playthrough, I got accosted. I got accosted in Hong Kong, and that screwed me up big time. I ended up getting to like Yokohama and everything, and then everything went to shit. 
So, if I can avoid Hong Kong, I think I'll be okay. Our fellow passengers were a mix of convicts, political radicals, prospectors, businessmen, and military officers. Pretty much the most dangerous train I could be on right now, I'm sure. In the midst of this was a young lady, Rosa. Wearing a bored expression as she was harangued by her formidable maman. I made her acquaintance only too easily. She was desperate for a sympathetic ear and told me her great secret. She had fallen in love with a peasant boy in fourth class called uh, Jack, by which I understood that they had shared a glance of extreme passion in the baggage car. I promised I would give her any aid I could to pursue her tryst. What else could I do? Surely it would provi provide some entertainment on our long voyage. We crossed the Volga in the early afternoon, crawling slowly over a bridge perched on high stone pillars. It was a muddy, sluggish river, clogged with floating islands of rafts and large steamers bound for the Cap Caspian Sea. I could just hear the lilting, rhythmic, oar beaten songs of the Volga boatmen over the whistles of steamboats. So now I'm helping somebody pursue true love. Hey, I need a subplot to get myself engaged while I'm on this train, damn it. Ooh, look at this. Experimental hovercraft to launch from Yokohama soon. I think I'd be willing to try that out. Okay, so. That's something I missed out in my first run of the game. I never really waited. I always attended to my master or talked with people. But talking with people right now, I've kind of hit a bunch of dead ends. So I just opened up a huge opportunity. So now I really want to get to Yokohama via not from... Hong Kong. We cost the Urals today. At the risk of sounding like a jaded traveler, I must admit that they are heartily magnificent. A heaving up of earth and forested hills for a few hundred miles. We stopped for an hour at Ekaterinburg, where I spotted a young lady slipping off to fourth class. Her worried mama followed soon after, demanding whether anyone had seen her daughter, daughter Rosa. I made an excuse for Rosa, gesturing discreetly in the direction of the lavatories. What the hell? <laughs> My game, the game minimized at that point. The love story is too intense. There were mixed sex conveniences and a cause of much inconvenience, truth be told. Her mama was convinced and settled down to her luncheon with gusto. Rosa returned a half hour hence, cheeks flushed but otherwise unharmed. She cast me a grateful glance. I could only hope her little amour would not blossom into outright scandal. Damn right, and I'm going to succeed this time too. Time on board trains take on a meditative quality. I visited the library bar car and met Galand, the daughter of a Mongol chieftain who was poring over a thick volume of algebra. I lamented my lack of mathematical skill aloud, and she laughed. I must study algebra if I am to be an engineer in the Imperial Army of Russia. I wish to leave behind my ancestor's warrior pass. It is a new world, I observed. We may remake ourselves as we like. <laughs> just so. She folded the book close. You have traveled, monsieur. They call us barbarians, don't they? She asks. Who are they? And what do they matter? I demanded with fine rhetoric and spirit. Your life is yours. She leaned forward, eyes shining. The truth is, there is more going on in my country than most outsiders know. We are growing fast as a people. Uh, 
Oops. You are as bad as them all, she declared. You think us nothing but Genghis Khan's minions. Oh, shit. Well, I was on the right tracks there, I think. But then I fucked myself. Of course. So we decanted a full score of British, Dutch, and German merchants and took on more military officers who cleared an entire first-class carriage for the use of a mysterious couple. I caught a brief glimpse of the woman behind a bristle of bayonets. I was fairly overset with curiosity, but it would be several days before I encountered the couple again. Oh, good. Oh, Rosa is talking to me. Oh wait, no, that wasn't the woman I, I die pissed off. Alright. <laughs> Kermskaya is a junction for trains into China. Alright, so... I'm just trying to get as many... I was trying to exhaust all the options I didn't pick. Berlin Railway Man locks up incognito dignitary. There's a dignitary on this train? I think that's what they were implying. Uh oh. Rosa absconded once again and her mother caused quite a ruckus in the breakfast car. Apparently the girl is affiance to a rich, rather stiff-looking German merchant who boarded at Omsk. I predict this comedy of errors will come to no happy end. As the sun set over the taiga, Monsieur Fogg expressed a mild boredom with the monotonous view from the carriage windows. My own rather more dire feelings may be extrapolated from this foggish understatement. <laughs> Jokes. Danish victory and cycle race up tower. <laughs> oh yeah, that did happen, didn't it? So we're on day 20 and we're almost there to uh, Karimskaya. Karimskaya, however you want to pronounce it. I think we're making really excellent use of our time. Considering how long it's going to take me to get across uh, to the US, I'm going to have to rely on getting to Yokohama and then hoping this experimental uh, trip to Honolulu isn't going to kill me. That's the hope. So I'm being strategic by avoiding Hong Kong entirely. I'm going to go from here to Vladivostok all the way down to Yokohama and then I'm going to make my way to Honolulu to San Francisco and then we're going to figure out our uh, trajectory from there. Hopefully with a lot more money because <laughs> money is actually going to be a big issue. I'm guessing this experimental craft is going to be quite pricey. So we crossed the halfway mark of our journey today. In the morning, we wound up in the Angara Valley towards the mining camp of uh, Urkus, the great city of Siberia. I saw Gal Galan disembarking with her suitcase of books, and forgive me, I hid. She met a man on the platform, an uncle perhaps, who scooped her up with great familiarity and led her away to a horse parked neatly in the yard beyond. We waited while the luggage was unloaded by leisurely porters and rough-clad mujiks until the whistle blew and the train's engines wound up once more. Our journey continued and by afternoon we had reached a magnificent expanse of Lake Baikal as clear as the finest crystal, bounded by flower-banked cliffs on the western shore and containing a thriving 
uh, raucous population of freshwater seals. The track ended at the lake's edge, but the great trains showed no signs of slowing or stopping. I began to feel, as my master would say, a little perturbed. Now, my friends, this next sentence will seem to you the invention of a madman, but I assure you it is utter unvarnished truth. We drove straight from the shore onto the clear water of the wake, causing barely a ripple. I looked out of the compartment window and saw the wheels pulled up, and... Z z z something French! The train was hovering in the air of oh, some unseen mechanism. I looked for the tracks and could only just see them against the gleam of the lake. They were cur cunningly built upon pontoons, which only just broke the surface of the water, though we did not touch them. What sort of train was the Trans-Siberian? A fascinating one. Kremskaya free from refugees. Don't know what to think of that, but... Oh, goody. Already deciding to get ourselves into trouble, are we? I contrived a meeting with the mysterious couple, though to be strictly accurate, I knocked over the red-haired woman. Entirely accidentally. She was very game about the whole unfortunate incident and introduced herself as Madame Kasina Petrovna Volkova. I apologized profusely to the point where she clearly felt rather sorry for me and invited me back to her heavily guarded carriage. Her companion turned out to be an engineer by the name of Sinan Yahudi, who... seemed lonely and eager to converse in any language other than Russian. He had defected from the Ottoman sultans to the Russian Tsar some years ago and was the genius behind the rapid construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway. He seemed reluctant to talk about the uh, talk of it, and so I changed the subject to lighter topics. He had a particular fascination with minerals and could hold forth in, on them for hours. I listened eagerly, nodding and exclaiming at the more obscure facts which he revealed to me with relish. He rummaged in his bags and presented me with a chunk of glittering green malachite. This was mine and the Urals. I want you to have it, Passapadu, he said. It has some value. I hope it will be of some use to you. The hour grew late, and I took my leave. Madame Vokova thanked me for entertaining her companion and warned me to say nothing of what Monsieur Yehudi had told me to anyone, with a smile that bellied her light-hearted tone. A strange day. Ooh, so... San Francisco is where we should try and get to, huh? Oh, and apparently I'm dapper. I am pretty awesome. There's little to report of the outside world, so a word today on Russian eating habits, more specifically, the Russian distaste for, distaste for regular mealtimes. I met a fellow Frenchman today who said to me, the Russian meal is a guide to the Russian character. I begged him to explain further, and he obliged me. The guiding principle of the national cuisine is that all dishes must be capable of being served at any time the eater feels disposed. He sacrifices his finer susceptibilities to his love of freedom. I resolve to keep this thought in mind on future approaches to the dining car. If our locomotive suppers are not triumphs of culinary art, they are at least signal examples of logistical achievement. Ooh, looks like we're at the end of our journey. Let's see if there's anything you can say. You can see the northern lights from there if you're lucky. Ah, <laughs> oh, Passapadu, you are flattering me, but you do it well. On the subject of trains, I've heard one can travel aboard the Canadian Pacific Railway from Calgary to Regina. You can pick up walrus teeth. What? That doesn't sound. That doesn't sound pleasant. And you can get good false teeth in Calgary, you can sell for profit in Chicago. What the hell? What's with the Canadians and teeth? Dark, if you're watching this, do you have something to tell me? 